Hey Jim there, uh, am I going to be able to use that, uh, that great weapon master there uh, in your upcoming campaign? Where did you get this thing? Victory and Defeat. Oh. It's a new store. Yeah. Cool. I mean, are we, um, are we talking about feats today? Yeah, we're going to talk about feats. Oh, great. On WebDM. When we're talking about feats in D&D, &D, uh -huh, uh -huh. there there's some people that don't like them, some, some people that ban them outright. They don't like them, they ban them, they change them. They yeah. change them constantly, like, let's, let's talk about why, let's unpack feats, let's right? unpack the feats. If I'm not mistaken, and I very well may be, mm -hmm. but if I'm not mistaken, feats make their first appearance in like the 2.5 edition, oh. which is sort of like second edition post skills and powers. Okay. Remember those books? There are a lot yes. of things that showed up in third edition. That's where they the first skills show and up. powers books. Yeah, showed up in the skills and powers books. Not unlike, say, Star Wars Saga edition or the Tome of Battle for fourth edition. Those oh, those abilities, sort of those sort of things showing up. Like feats are, I, I think they're there, but they make their big debut in third edition, right? Like that was one of the big things in the hype lead up to third edition was like, we're gonna have feats. There's gonna be skills. I don't know how many feats there were for for third edition, but I bet if you factor in third party, there's more than a thousand. There's probably more than a thousand just from Wizards of the Coast, I bet. Every book had feats. It was like contractual. That yeah. You couldn't put out a book for third edition without including a bunch of feats for it. Yeah. And of course, Pathfinder is the successor to this edition, mm -hmm. and I'm sure uh, our viewers out there that play Pathfinder can commiserate, is that you get feet bloat. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that became the Achilles heel, so to speak, of feats. Yeah. Right. And, and there are some of them that are obviously and purposefully designed to be traps, to be like, yeah. you, you only a noob picks this feat. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking right. noobs. It created an environment of play that led to, I, I personally think, a lot of people feeling like they had to optimize their characters. Yeah. They had to plot out their characters in advance Mm -hmm. Because they're going to have to make 20 choices for feats or something like that. Yeah, because I really want whirlwind attack. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So that's, you know, and what's the quickest way to get there? How fast can you get it? Well, you're going to need to be a human fighter. That's and so, where you start. That's where you start. And so feats had prerequisites. Some of them could only be taken at first level. Yep. Obviously, others could only be taken later on after you'd gone up the feat chain, maybe taking four or five other feats uh -huh. that give you, and there's these incremental little bitty things, plus two here, a plus one. One there. Extra opportunity Extra attacks. Extra little bits mm -hmm. and pieces and everything until eventually after you've after you've delved through your mountain of books and you've <laughs> you've built your character out of as many sources as you can yeah. and all everything's running on all cylinders you've and you've gold bloomed for weeks and gold months. bloomed for weeks. <laughs> that's kind of what it was like. That's how I remember it and that's okay. how shaking off the residue of that yeah. has been mostly what I've done the last year and a half doing of just being like, you know what, I need to purge myself of third edition in order to enjoy fifth edition for what it is that's personal things not y'all i'm not gonna make that y'all's hang up that's me yeah so feats are also in fourth edition right and it's much the same situation minus the third party um mm -hmm. third party feats by the time they get them to fifth edition i like the intent yeah. behind them i like that feats offer multiple uh benefits right well, yeah, yeah i mean you could have the same background class subclass combo but you could have a vastly different character based on what feats you do buy right you know you could take the entertainer feat and yes. ro rock the fuck out so in, wow! fi in fifth edition we've got a situation where yeah. feats offer multiple things so gone are the days of the incremental nitpicky little feats yeah of third edition because you might only be taking one or two feats over mm -hmm. the course of your entire character's uh, career before you before they retire you want that to be big you want it to be a big deal a character defining trait right but the problem that i have with fifth edition feats is that there are obviously some that are meant for purely combat boosting and others yes. that are meant to round out a character or to provide some kind of mechanical support for a concept they have to compete for the same limited number of slots. Not everybody's getting a feat at first level. That's really only variant humans unless you're playing with a house rule. Yeah. Although I do see it as a common house rule. A lot of people are like, yeah. Everybody gets a feat at first everybody level. Everybody gets a feat. That, you know, particularly for those tables where the DMs are like, I want people to play more than just variant humans. 
Right, um, right. Because that's the kind of players that they have. They might and just say like, unless okay. Unless they're really those kind of players, then everyone plays a variant human <laughs> right. with the bonus feat. So it's like, wait, I can have two feats at when first I level? Two, yeah, I, I think if they do that, if, if I were, I would be like, there is no variant human. Yeah, you just, just have the normal human, everybody, everybody gets a feat. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Uh, yeah. Wait, 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 I can two, have two, two feats two at first level? Feats, I'm going to take pole arm master and great weapon rest. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so there are some builds in 5th edition that are feet heavy. Oh, but yes. But they're nothing like the 3rd edition builds where you need like 15 something feats or something. They're more like you need 3 or 4. Y- yeah. And like, that's a lot yeah, in 5th edition. A good example of that, Tobias the Ebon Foe. Right. He was a human fighter. Mm-hmm. Two weapon fighter. I had it all. Weapon focus, specialization. Uh-huh. Two weapon fighting. Improved two weapon fighting. Oh, dodge mobility. Yeah. Ambidexterity. Mm-hmm. Dodge mobility. Like Jeez. by the time I got done, I'm exhausted. All feats, and it's just like, oh my god, I can't yeah, yeah. move. So in fifth edition, we've avoided that situation, thankfully. Yes. But we've replicated a situation where there are clearly some choices that are better than others, and I know that for some players and, and dungeon masters, that really gets to them, and others are just like, who cares like obviously some are better some choices are better than others and depending on the campaign you play in the relative value of the feats is going to be different if you're playing in an intrigue heavy character plot driven sort of style of game then maybe things like actor and observant are going to be really useful because you need to read lips and impersonate people there's a lot of uh, espionage that's going on mm-hmm. then having keen mind might be really great so you can read yeah. a missive from someone and recall it perfectly mm-hmm. uh, and with perfect accuracy and in those situations nobody cares about a great sword wielding barbarian who can disintegrate a town guard in one hit it's like great yeah that doesn't help us out we yeah. needed information from that town guard <laughs> right so feats are ca- are campaign specific a lot of times when you see discussions about which feats are the best or which ones are problem feats mm-hmm. it's a bunch of white room theory crafting yeah just op- going on. yeah 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 optimization i can get 10 more damage it's like yeah mm, okay i don't think character optimization is the devil no and i certainly don't buy into this business that you can't both role play and optimize your character in fact i see it quite the opposite in order for me to role play my character well i require mechanical support to do that i like a blending of the two fluff and crunch well it is part of a balanced gaming breakfast it is Uh, you've talked about this many times if there is no support i mean we're just standing around telling stories which is great and all which is great and all and there's times when that's appropriate but i came here to play the game of dungeons and dragons which involves storytelling and manipulating the mechanics and and is an emergent thing that happens as you play it creating a pro and con list for feats right 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 i would i would rack those kinds of things up in the pro uh, pro category it allows for character customization including feats Mm -hmm. it allows for mechanical support for role-playing concepts. If I am I playing a Sherlock Holmes inspired character, then I want observant and keen, keen mind. Both of those. I want those things. Yes. Those are gonna those are going to flesh out and, and give me the kind of character that I want to play. Who cares if that means I'm not I'm doing less damage? Or who cares if that means I'm less survivable than I could be? Yeah, you found uh, every clue that led you along the path to right, where you are. Right. I want to play a master detective. And so it does bother me that not all feats are equally viable. But then not every game of Dungeons and Dragons is the same, so all the feats don't need to be equally viable in yeah. that respect. All feats are equal, just some are more equal than others. It, depending on the yeah. campaign, <laughs> Depending on the campaign, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and so, you know. yes, absolutely. You know, if you're playing, let's say you're playing in Dark Sun, and metal is scarce, and, and, and so there's not a lot of big heavy weapons that are going to be used. Uh, it's mostly smaller weapons made of bone and stone and obsidian. There are going to be some feats where you can take great, we- great weapon master. You can take polar master if you want. Mm-hmm. But don't count on finding a great axe. Don't count on fighting that two-handed sword or glaive or whatever it is that you're looking for because my setting doesn't have those kinds of things as readily available. That would be a very unique thing that you would have to mm-hmm. have enough metal to create a great sword in a world like Dark Sun. Right, right. Uh, or even something like uh, Heavy Armor Master or something like that. You, you want to check first. Uh, uh, obviously check with your Dungeon Master first. Those are some reasons why you would, you'd you'd want to use feats. Um, obviously, some reasons why you don't are it is an avenue for power gaming. 
and there are some people that really bothers them. They they yeah. they see power gamers as ruining the game for them, and and probably rightly so. They usually have some experience with someone who has exploited the rules to such an extent that it made the game worse for other people. That sucks. I'm really sorry that that <laughs> that, that happened. Don't play with those people. They don't do it. Yeah. Um, either ask them to change their behavior or kick them out of your group. Oh, <laughs> right. Controversy. <laughs> but there are other reasons why you might not want to use feats, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I see feats as maybe pigeonholing a character. If all you do is take great weapon shit and then you lose your weapon, then what are you gonna do? And I, I, I mean, like we can't. We came through this, uh, or or you get an insanely awesome weapon that isn't in your feat build, right? But it's just like, well, I'm not gonna use this awesome weapon, yeah, because it's not two handed. Yes, yeah. You can't plan for that. Mm -hmm. But if you've taken three feats that are all great weapon feats. Particularly for warriors, right? Like, yeah. I like a warrior that's deadly with any weapon. Like, it doesn't matter. You get this person in a room with other weapons, mm -hmm. and they're going to they're gonna kill you. They're going to they're gonna do violence. Right, right. To say, like, yeah, I only fight with this one weapon. Yeah. My guy only uses a war hammer. My warrior princess only uses her chakra to, <laughs> yeah, to, yeah. to slay others. And it's like... That's nice, mm -hmm. and I can understand wanting that kind of concept, right? The blade master that uses their heirloom sword to, you know, split hairs and slice open reality. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. one of those things where it's like that is a, a, a valid concept, <laughs> but, but I, I I think it's also worth saying like, yeah, you're you're deadly with any weapon, and so mm -hmm. having feats, uh, you run the risk of, of pigeonholing yourself. You're less good at the things that you should otherwise be. Yeah, be good I mean, at. it might be awesome to make people suffocate because you've learned how to cut all the oxygen molecules in half. Because <laughs> right. that's how good you are. <laughs> but like the Atomic Samurai. Yeah, the Atomic Samurai. Right. Yes. <laughs> oh my God, they need to come out with a second season of that shit right now. When using feats, like how should you consider feats when when talking about character creation with point by versus rolling stats. I mean, you're, you're using a limited character resource in order to acquire a feat. Right. You know, obviously, every time you get an ability score increase, you could increase your ability scores. Or if your DM allows it, they've, they've weighed the, the pros and cons, they've, they've decided, yep, they're willing to do the work to include feats in their game and adjust their games mm -hmm. to include those, uh, the, the powerful feats. Then it, you have a choice as a player. I like that dilemma. I like the fact that it's tied to your sort of total level. And if you're multi-classing a lot, you're not gonna get access to those ability score increases as often as someone who just sticks with their class. I like that it adds that. Not only in terms of multi-classing, it, it forces them to make that decision, which we've covered in two of our multi-classing shows, which you feel mm -hmm. free to check out, but mm -hmm. also because if you, even if you stick with one class for you know the entire level that you're that you're gaming, you want to offer the the player some kind of meaningful choice. You want to say like, yeah, you you have to pick here. Yeah. And if you roll stats, then you have a, a usually have a greater likelihood of having your primary stat be closer to max, mm -hmm. meaning that there's less of an opportunity to have to force that dilemma on the player. Right. Right. That's why I like saying you. I'm going to give the group a choice. If you want feats. We can use point by, or if you're really wanting to roll stats, we can roll stats and not use feats. I think that's something that I'm experimenting with, with maybe using. I, I don't know where I stand on it quite mm -hmm. yet, just because at the end of the day, it doesn't bother me too much if a player yeah. starts with say a 20 and then can immediately, <laughs> in their main stat, and can immediately start uh, taking feats at, at fourth level. But I know yeah. it really bothers some DMs. Yeah, if you're if you're starting an opinion poll, uh, yeah, you know me, I love rolling and I love feats. And you love rolling so. and both. <laughs> I think it's a nice compromise though, either this or that. You can get you get rolled stats with the opportunity to start with some really great stats if you want, or it's opportunity to roll some mediocre ones as well. Yeah, I was gonna say, that's why I made that face when you said that. I was like, I can already hear some people out there like, that doesn't always guarantee. It doesn't always guarantee. Uh, well, and when you roll 46, drop the lowest, seven times drop the lowest. Uh, yeah, there's a higher likelihood. I, I you know, usually usually what it is, like, oh, they got 17, and then they do this. And we don't want to start we point do, by versus. We, we do have another video on the point, merits of point yeah. by versus uh, rolled stats. I find that as a, a nice compromise, because I like the fact that, you know, if you're doing point by, then your, pro, your max stat is, uh, or your, you know, your prime stat probably going to be maybe somewhere through 15 through 17, depending on mm -hmm. what your modifier is, how many points you're wanting to put into something. Thing. Yeah, and then it forces those decisions. You have to start looking at like, well, do I really want that extra point of AC and to hit with ranged weapons, mm -hmm. whatever? Or would I like Skulker because it fits more with my rogues right. kind of mo? To get into it the way I think about it, it's like, well, why would you ever go for a 17 when you could get a 16 and use those points for something else mm -hmm. at character creation? But maybe 
you do want a 17 because at fourth level you want to take one of those feats that gives you a plus one plus right. something else. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, that's and a, so you have to start yeah. weighing that. Yeah. And I like it, it. And so I like that. I like forcing those decisions both at the meta level of character creation and what happens at level up. And I also like them in character as well. Like forcing these sort of I don't I I want both and I'm going to have to choose mm -hmm. sorts of decisions as, as just a dungeon master. I think that's more interesting. Like I said, I'm I'm considering that sort of house rule of letting the group decide either or. I suspect at the end of the day, because feats are a player-oriented rule and a player-oriented portion of the game, that I will ultimately do what the players want on this. Yeah. If I'm playing with a bunch of people and, and they're all like, no, we want feats and we want to roll stats, and I'm just going to be like, okay, that's fine. I'm not going to put up a fight about it. All right, 3D6 in a row. Is what you wanted, guys. Uh, it should have been more specific. <laughs> well, that's not what we, no, you, I believe you said you wanted to roll your stats and you wanted feats. 3D6 in a row, and you can have feats. And you can have your feats. I, I'm sorry. I would love to run a 5th edition campaign. A 5th edition campaign. Like that. 3D6 in a row. You give us a bonus feat at first level. Okay. And you do standard human. Standard. No variant. Sure. And I think that would be a lot of fun. I think that could be a lot of fun. We'll have to we'll have to uh, to look into that. We've played in games without feats, and I mm -hmm. found myself missing them in some way. Yeah. If only because there are some things that are still locked behind a feat, right? Like if you want to be really good with a shield, if you want to like Captain America it up, you're gonna need feats and probably a magic item, magic shield. Yeah. Uh, in order to get everything that you want out of it, there are people out there, and I'm sometimes one of them, who will say it's a matter of description. If you want to be good with your shield, then describe your character as being good with their shield. Make your attack roll and describe what happens with that attack roll as a batch with the shield. I bank it off the thing and they hit some, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the mechanical support is what we're looking for with feats. We want more than just a description. Right. It's necessary. You want to describe your character's actions, but insufficient to, to getting what you're really after. Like you said, they can unlock, unlock certain avenues because like maybe you want to be a fighter and you want just just a touch of magic. You but you don't really want to take Eldritch Knight. Right. Like magic, you got magic initiate. Magic You got Ritual Caster. You got Spell Sniper, right? I think, I believe that the, you don't have to have... No, uh, I think was, you have to have the ability to attack to cast one spell. Ah, that's a prerequisite for that. As so a prerequisite. That up. Um, but either way, you have Magic Initiate and you do have Ritual Caster that will give you uh, some options if you want a taste of magic and you don't want to multi-class, you're not allowed to multi-class or you don't want to take one of the uh, one of the other options available to you. It does require require more work for the dungeon master. It does. Right, like feats are an optional rule, um, although sometimes you wouldn't know it. And, yeah. <laughs> and so it means that the baseline stats for monsters, mm -hmm. the baseline stats for NPCs, those will need to be adjusted because you have included an optional rule. Right. And I, I, there are times when I wish it was clear. I wish it was sort of like in big yellow and red. Warning! Here right. are the thi here are explicitly the things a dungeon master needs to do if you have decided to include these character options. In your right, game. right. But there's not. I'm sorry if you think about it though. I mean, you got a barbarian that if you know fourth level to take great weapon master. So at fifth level, they're a frenzy barbarian. You got three attacks. That's an extra 30 damage coming at you. Right, and they can give themselves advantage. They can give themselves advantage. They don't care about that minus five. Right. So that's a possible extra 30 damage coming at your monsters every single round every single from round. one feat. We'll talk a bit here in a minute about like the problem feats. But a DM has to make a decision in that moment. My barbarian character has chosen to be badass with that axe. Yeah. And I am facing the possibility that every time that barbarian attacks mm -hmm. of dealing with an extra 30 points of damage at fifth level uh, yeah. from my barbarian. Do I alter my hit points for the monsters is the question you have to ask. My answer is sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes you do. But that character chose Great Weapon Master because they want to put monsters in the ground fast. Yeah. And there are times when you throw an unmodified, with hit points unmodified, a monster at the barbarian, and that barbarian just chews through it. And there are sometimes you throw a monster with max hit points and more on top of it to give the barbarian something to have to really work at. Yeah, let them let them chew on it for a little while. Let them have to Before just sit there for us with a seven hundred hit point monster. <laughs> With so maybe while not, we were. Maybe not at fifth level. You know, that barbarian isn't the only one in the party, presumably. Right. There's others contributing towards the success of a combat encounter. Mm -hmm. um, and while dead is the best status effect, combat is more than just putting monsters in the ground quickly. There's other things going on. And, and a lot of dungeon masters incorporate other things into their combats so that it isn't just a slog fest. So there's a choice you make. And I think that the choice is like many things, contextual. Do I do I modify my monsters to account for characters who are 
really good at combat? And the answer is, yeah, sometimes you should. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you shouldn't so that those characters who are supposed to be really good at combat get to yeah. be really good. You could avoid a wharf situation where yeah. your badass is constantly getting their ass whooped. <laughs> I don't want to have to go through this again, Jim. <laughs> He's a visual litmus test. Uh -huh. We already know how badass uh -huh. Klingons uh -huh. are. Yeah. We're just trying to show how badass the other uh -huh. things are. Uh -huh. I know, I get or it. Or just skip to DS9 where just he kicks the, the shit DS9. out of just every... Watch he literally, they're like, trust me, you're going to love it when you get to this other series. You're going to destroy everything in the, ga in, in the Gamma Quadrant. Um, thank you, Michael Jim Adar, Dorn. fuck you. Thank you, Michael Dorn. <laughs> yes, Michael Dorn, thank you for your service. Come on our show. Uh, please come on our show. I was just going to ask you uh, what, what some of your favorite uh, what some of your favorite feats uh, from from like the the new ones from Xanathar's. Uh, oh, maybe yeah. some of those those UA that got left behind. They got left behind. There was yeah. a lot of great feats that were in the Unearthed Arcana. I'd l I hope that the skill feats and the tool feats return to us in another capacity. I don't know how. I would figure they'd be in Xanathar's. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I think they were just trying to win, where they combine the tools and the skills they were trying to yeah I, I give you a little more a little instead more. but i know what you're talking about yeah. like those skill tool feats with i just i really liked them i also liked the weapon feat some of the weapon feats that they released earlier uh -huh. even though it seemed like they were breaking their own rules in that on arcana that they set us up with they're like feats should do x y and z like a feat shouldn't make an action exclusive it should yeah. all you know someone with the feet and without should still be able to attempt the action and then they're like only people that took this feat can do this one thing and i just was like kind of seems like anybody that wields a flail should be able to do that. Yeah. I like Spear Fighter from it because I remember that scene in Hero, right, with Jet Li and he's fighting the guy with the spear. I remember those scenes from Troy with what mm -hmm. it was Eric Bana and Brad Pitt going at each other as Achilles yeah, the, and the, uh, Hector. The, the big fight. Yeah. That's pretty fucking amazing. In general, I find anything that boosts the efficiency of spears and slings, that gets a, a yes from me. Yeah. Come on, bring it in. Um, and so I, well, I, that's why I like spear fighting. Because there's two, there are two weapons that fundamentally change combat. Right, and they need more love in Dungeons and Dragons, right. I think. Especially the sling, come on. Come on. Uh, in, in The Song of Ice and Fire, uh -huh. the books, yeah. where there's a description outside of Marine, uh -huh. I think, one uh -huh. of the slave cities where she sees the execution and then they're, they're using they're the using slings, slings to basically quarter people. Yeah. Like, taking them off at the elbow and the shoulder, and it's just like, the fact that you don't need to be Right. Skilled with a bow, yeah. you're literally just, just literally like, a piece of leather and a rock. It's really cool, I, and so I, 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 that's why I like Spear Fighter because yeah. I thought it was a, a, a neat feat that takes a humble weapon and says, in the hands of a trained warrior, this goes from beyond being a, a, a stick with a sharp point mm -hmm. into being as elegant and graceful as a long sword or a rapier or something that they can use. My other favorite feat is Gourmand. Yeah. I, I really liked that one. Uh, I am of the opinion that there's not enough eating of monsters in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And that uh, that eating of monsters should give you benefits and bonuses. All right, so the party's just gotten done with their adventure. They've used almost all their spells. They're beaten and bloodied, but still heroic. Mm -hmm. And beside them is the giant trunk corpse of a purple worm mm -hmm. that they're slowly roasting bits off of and maybe someone else is extracting the essential mm -hmm. oils from the hide that they're going to create some kind of poison with and someone else is skinning it because they're going to get the good leather for their armor and then there's the halfling or the whoever or someone else entirely maybe it's a dragonborn or something over the stove cooking up their little purple worm stew and yeah. giving everybody a bonus to their saving throws depending on what they make yeah i don't know that's just uh, that really appeals to me <laughs> or 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 same scenario as as far as the party goes, they're all ass kicked. They're out. They're out of uh -huh. everything. But they just killed a troll, so they got to cook down this troll. Cook it down. Eat it a little bit, and then everybody starts to heal just uh -huh. a little bit. Yep. It's like, well, this isn't going to do the trick. It'll keep us alive. It'll until, keep us alive. But yeah. mm. you got to eat it quickly. Yeah, eat it quickly. <laughs> <Yes>. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to cook this. And I'm going to need to eat. What? You, you got to cook it one bite at a time. Basically, you got to cook it one bite at a time. You have to shave off a little bit of it, and it's it's one of those things you shave off a thin bit, and you fry it up a little bit, and then you serve the uh, <laughs> troll chips. Yeah. Yeah, the troll chips, oh. troll sashimi. That's why I like Gourmand. From uh, uh, Xanathar's Guide, I'm a fan of Prodigy and, and Bountiful Luck. Yeah. Uh, anything that gives me expertise I'm, I, is going to be great. That's why I like Prodigy. And I have yeah. a character in mind that Bountiful Luck fits in neatly for, but now they're a wizard with three feats. 
and that's a he that's a feet heavy build for a wizard. For me, just because I used it with my samurai, I'm sorry, but uh, what is it, Orcish uh, Fury? Uh huh. Uh -huh. Orcish Fury is just it's just the, it's just the most perfect thing. I mean, you get right. that extra die to just save for that crit. <laughs> Keep that extra die a day stored away for that crit. You're uh -huh. gonna get one. You're gonna, then you're happen. gonna get another that you double. That you double, yeah. And then uh, you know, if you do drop, getting that extra attack, like getting knocked down, <laughs> you like get right up. You <laughs> come back at him. Yeah, there are a lot of great feats, and even from like the player's handbook, Lucky is a great. I take try to take Lucky there, but three free rerolls. Yeah, but even others that are not. I like Keen Mind for an illusionist because mm -hmm. you're creating visual illusions. This is a character that can recreate something perfectly. I always wanted an illusionist that was like you know like the show Sherlock where he's in his mind palace. Except this guy's like, and I'll show you everybody what my mind palace looks like. Boom. And it's perfectly recreated. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the kind of illusionist uh, that I would want to play. Yeah, when Sherlock goes into his description of the scene, he literally is like, "This guy literally now remember, shows you." Remember at the scene, <laughs> the body yeah. was here. There was blood splatter uh -huh, here. Uh -huh. you know? And their intricate minor illusion for new DMs, right? You look at the feats, and maybe you read online that they're just like. Man, do not use these. These are going to ruin your game. And they hear horror story after horror story. It's not that bad. Yeah. Take a deep breath. Allow the ones you want. Don't allow the others. Change them up. Whatever well, you got to do. You, yeah. you mentioned it earlier. There's there's some problem children amongst the there group that, that pretty much if there's a fighter type or even just a, a blaster, they're probably going to take these feats. Yes. And everybody knows which ones we're going to talk about. I already mentioned one. Everyone knows which ones we're talking about. But in case they don't, in case you're not everyone. Right. You got Great Weapon Master. Great Weapon Master. You got Sharpshooter. Sharpshooter. And you got crossbow expert. Crossbow expert. So the first two, great weapon master and sharpshooter, share a, a similar problem in that they let you trade uh, a, a to hit bonus for a massive increase in damage, plus minus five to hit for plus ten damage. Mm -hmm. And and part of the reason this is uh, this is makes life difficult for dungeon masters is that it's ridiculously easy to offset that that penalty to hit mm -hmm. whether it's through the archery fighting style for sharpshooters and the fact that their minus five is really a minus three yeah um or the fact that like we talked about for barbarian but even other classes it can be very easy to get advantage mm -hmm. uh, on your attacks and therefore you could always just roll with that plus 10 damage and if you've got a heavily optimized character that's maxed out there to hit bonus um, and maybe even used those weapon feats from Ar Unearthed Arcana to give them a plus one with a certain weapon that they're using. Mm -hmm. What you get is a situation where the, the, the dungeon master feels like, man, my characters curb stomp everything, everything I throw at them. If they're not prepared for it, or if they don't have the time to put in the work to customize their monsters and to, and to really make sure that the encounters that they're building mm -hmm. are... Are, are gonna be challenging, yeah. then they're gonna look at those feats and say like, yeah, these are real problems for me. Yeah, because if you got that fighter who didn't go battle master, so they can give themselves advantage with one of their maneuvers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they decide to take great weapon master, and then with another feat, they decide to take magic initiate, mm -hmm. and just so they can get fine familiar, <laughs> to give themselves advantage. <laughs> it oh, is uh, one way of getting there. <laughs> um, or hell, just ritual caster. Yeah, you, you know? can do it with ritual caster as well. I I think that for great weapon master, there's a, there's a lot of different changes that I've seen. Mm -hmm. I've seen some people say it's not minus five, it's disadvantage. And therefore, being able to grant yourself advantage... Yeah, that's one way to do it. Doesn't, ...it doesn't completely negate that penalty. However, it, disadvantage and advantage do cancel each other out, and then you'll just be in a situation where they have no penalty to hit and mm -hmm. plus 10 damage. I've seen some that replace the damage boost by just a, uh, you know, a, a flat bonus to strength, and therefore it becomes... Great Weapon Master kind of becomes like one of the half feats. They can choose, like, say, plus one to strength or con, and you get the bonus attack on a crit or when you drop someone, and maybe there's another benefit uh, to using it. I think that that's too much. You're cutting out too much of the, 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 the power and appeal of that mm -hmm. feat. And at that point, you should just say, there is no Great Weapon Master. If you're going to get rid of the damage bonus, that's kind of why you show up for it, right? Yeah, I that's mean... That's how it seems, to me at least. I mean, yeah, the, the bonus attack is nice. I mean, a whole other chance for another crit, another right. hit. Right. Is awesome. Is nice. Of the two between Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter, Sharpshooter is the more egregious because it removes a lot of the penalties for ranged combat that keep ranged combat from dominating Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And without those penalties, ranged combat becomes the preferred way of engaging in combat for power gamers and optimizers and things like that. Well, yeah. Because it's like, yeah, I, you mean I can attack and engage with a foe from hundreds of feet away 
without having to worry about getting hit myself. Yeah. And I, I how can I make a paladin that does this? Right. <laughs> <laughs> your paladin is just going to sit back there, a couple hundred feet away, and just like provide your your bonus to to saving throws while you have to deal with you do engage in long range sni- sniping and spell casting. Yeah. yeah. And the paladin player is going to sit there twiddling his thumbs, frustrated. So yeah. so people don't like sharpshooter and crossbow expert both because they remove between the two of those. There's like no penalties to ranged. Which is a big deal, and uh, maybe you want to be Legolas, and you want to dance through combat with your bow, stabbing people with arrows and shooting yeah. them point blank. I think that's why those feats are there to replicate that scene from Fellowship, and, and it's an hit. amazing scene. And it's an amazing scene. Yeah. But the mechanical impact of that is that you have fighters in full plate armor with a single hand crossbow shooting at people like it's a nine millimeter. <laughs> <laughs> and and, the and hammer. They're, they're not like <laughs> engaging in sword and sorcery action. They're minimizing harm to themselves and and not. In, it's just DMs don't like that image. Yeah, they're just, it's just like really. That's what you chose to do. The sharpshooter and crossbow expert are the two that I'm most tempted to be like, no, nah, get them out of here. I think that there's a place for sharpshooter thematically for mm-hmm. having a character that's like really good with a bow and, and everything, but. I don't like that they just completely negate the penalties that rein in raged combat. Yeah. How would you fix them then? How, what, what, what are your uh, solutions? Fix, yeah, you know, this is one of those things where at the end of the day, I do. There's a lot of hand wringing, a lot of reading about what other people do and everything, because they're player oriented feats or player oriented rules. I might just say, you know what? I will do the extra work needed to make sure that they don't steamroll what's going on. Mm -hmm. A personal example of this for my campaign is the very first 5th edition campaign we ran. I had a character with sharpshooter, a ranger assassin, hunter hunter assassin, a sharpshooter that in one round was able to take out a young adult dragon. Or something like that. It's been a while. I wish I'd kept better notes of it. But it was one of those moments in 5th edition where I was playing it and I was like, something was wrong here. And it wasn't the player's fault. It was my fault that the dragon didn't provide himself total cover, that the dragon didn't do anything to attempt to defend itself. Not even like once it knew there was a threat, just like it didn't do anything to defend itself full stop. It knew it was fighting the party. It wasn't like a chance encounter. It was specifically coming after you. So the fact that it didn't try to obtain invisibility or some other obscuring magic, the fact that it didn't cover itself in a fog cloud, which would prevent those kinds of things, the fact, the fact that it didn't try to sneak up from the ground. You were expecting an attack from air. Maybe it can come along the ground and try to get you that way. The fact that it didn't do anything to try to prevent those things and got itself killed was one of those things that made me go, wait a second, this isn't third edition. No. Where mm-hmm. feats are expected and, and baked in and don't provide that big of a bonus. Feats are a different beast here, and I'm going to have to do extra work. Yeah. My, in my case, in that solution was you guys didn't fight a dragon after that without it having a pocket spellcaster. It made sense for Tyranny of Dragons, right? Cult of the Dragons riling up all the dragons. They relied with the Red Wizards. But anyway, so I think, to make a long story short, I would fix the feats by doing extra work myself. Mm-hmm. And if I didn't want to do that extra work, then I think the simplest solution for me was to just say, those feats don't exist. If you want to be a really good archer, take the archery fighting style. If you want to be really good with a great weapon, take the great weapon fighting style. And those, these three feats, we're just going to get them out of here. Yeah. Not going to worry about rebalancing and everything. I think there are a lot of fine fixes and things out there. They're just... Uh, more work that I'd be willing to do, and I would rather put that effort into making the combat encounters more challenging than in fixing feats. So I guess it's kind of a cop-out answer. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Deal with it. Well. (laughs) Yeah. Didn't want to do the legwork there. I get it. I told you about the ruling they asked me on, right? No. Like last week at the game, they were like, hey, Pruitt, we need your ruling on something. And I'm like, really? oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what was Please it don't phrase it like that. What was it about? You're going to love this. All right, how would you rule on this, Jim Davis? All right. Two players Two had players. already been swallowed by a purple worm. Okay. Hole. All right. And so they were inside trying to escape. Uh-huh. Okay. But they were failing. They were being grappled. Yes. So technically they're being carried. Yeah. Then another player, not thinking, decides to cast Disintegrate on the purple worm. Yes. And you can guess what happened. It was enough to kill the purple worm. Yeah. 
who's carrying two players. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the description of the spell, yeah. anything anything being worn or carried by the blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But my thing was like, well, they're not objects, they're people, A. Mm -hmm. And B, I just think that's a dick move. Uh, mm -hmm. But the way he ruled it, he, <laughs> he, he one of them died. So. I probably would rule it as them dying because yeah. it's different than being carried in their hand. Yeah. It's inside them. Yeah. And it's not like the contents of their stomach is left, gonna be left behind, behind in the pile of ash. I think it's just kind of one of the, Now, I would have reminded the player casting Disintegrate. Are you sure you want to do that with two of your companions inside? Because yeah. that sounds like a player just wasn't paying attention, and it's not the other player's fault that they've got a dumbass player that can't pay attention. Yeah. So that's how I would rule it. it would, I, I would just try to head that off before. But then if they were like, yeah, I'm still going to disintegrate, I'd be like, well, yeah, they're it was kind one, of all up in its guts. Yeah, that's one thing is like apparently all the rolls were made and the people failed, like one person failed to save and one passed it mm -hmm. before they were like, wait, I don't want to do that. And he was like, they already yeah, rolled this saves. Is why you've got to, yeah, time. this has already happened. Jim you need to time. think yeah. before you cast disintegrate. <laughs> yeah. Don't just disintegrate at random. Yeah.